animals, nature, and religion. The world's major religions have much to teach us about our proper place in nature and how we ought to treat our fellow animals and relate to the rest of creation. According to the Hopi Indians, we are out of balance with the rest of creation, a condition which they term koyanaskatsi, which means life out of balance. The ancient spiritual philosophy of Taoism emphasized that the way to world peace and harmony is for humanity to live in balance with nature, which they depicted symbolically as the creative embrace of heaven and earth, or yin and yang. This unity and complementarity of opposites is symbolically depicted as Father Sky, or the Great Spirit, and Mother Earth by the Navajo Indians, whom they regard as our original parents. Native peoples also find spiritual symbolism in various creatures, the spider, for example, being sacred to many American Indians because it represents the seamless web of life or the unified field of existence in which everything is interconnected and interdependent. The modern science of ecology confirms this intuitive wisdom that all of life is interconnected and interdependent. This means that no species is more or less superior or inferior to any other. As one theologian has said, ecology is the science of the body of Christ, through which we of the earth community learn our sacred connectedness. In a spiritual sense, therefore, ecology reveals to us the sacred unity of all life. Molecular biology also teaches us about this unity and interdependence. The elements that make up our own bodies, such as carbon, phosphates, and nitrogen, circulate through the food chain and through the soil, the water, and even the air that we breathe. The old Zen aphorism that rocks are peopling rocks is true, insofar as the minerals from the rocks leach into the soil and are incorporated into plant life that we in turn eat and incorporate into our own bodies. In other words, the earth is our flesh and we should treat it with the same respect as we would treat our own bodies. Evolutionary biology also teaches us about the biological interconnectedness of various species. Even the structure of human DNA, which could be regarded as God's blueprint, is basically similar for human beings as it is for other animals and even for plants. Physiologically and anatomically, the human species is also essentially the same as any other vertebrate species. Charles Darwin, in his theory of evolution, insisted that human beings were not superior. Indeed, he used to write down on his hand every day, not superior, because he envisioned evolution like a tree with the various species occupying different branches. He did not envision a hierarchical ladder with Homo sapiens at the top. In Ecclesiastes, it is stated that the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and a man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and all turn to dust again. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of beast goes down to earth? In other words, it is vain for us to think that we are some kind of special creation, but this view is still widely held. The science of ethology, the study of animal behavior, reveals that humans and non-human animals share similar emotional states and often express their emotions in similar ways, like the greeting grin of the human and dog or wolf, which are virtually identical and express friendly intentions and the emotional feeling of pleasure and happiness. It is through the sharing of such affection with other animals that we enjoy communion with them. Ethology also teaches us that human beings are not the only animals who show empathy, altruism, and compassion. One dog, for example, will take care of a sick or injured companion, licking the other's sores and even providing it with food until it has recovered. The altruistic behavior of dogs rescuing other injured animals and even people has been eulogized by poets, artists, and others. We should not simply dismiss such behavior as irrational and unconsciously instinctive, but rather recognize that such altruistic behavior is not a uniquely human trait. It is a quality that we share with other animals. 
It is a tragic irony that in the face of scientific evidence to the contrary, we should treat such animals so cruelly as in biomedical research, where animals are all too often subjected to unnecessary, unconscionable suffering, even being shocked, mutilated, poisoned, and extensively burned in the name of medical progress for the benefit of human beings. Surely, no good ends can come from evil means. It is also a tragedy of the times that there are people who seem to enjoy seeing animals suffer, like those who own, train, and enjoy the spectacle of pit bull terriers tearing each other apart. This is certainly one of the most cruel and demeaning spectator sports in this modern age. Abraham Lincoln once said, I care not for a man's religion whose dog and cat are not the better for it. Animal cruelty of this kind reflects such a profound lack of empathy and emotional connectedness toward animals that it is surely a disease in itself. Much like the vivisection of animals in the name of scientific curiosity and knowledge for knowledge's sake. There is a widely held view that nature and animals have been created for man's own exclusive use and that animals do not have interests, inherent value, feelings or rights. Thus, it is not considered unethical to sacrifice them in the name of science. But to sacrifice them for magical and occult purposes, like making a power circle out of various decapitated animals with their heads impaled on stakes, is not acceptable today, even though ritual animal sacrifice was a religious practice having wide acceptance in the past. The erroneous notion that animals are unfeeling machines is called Cartesianism, which is the philosophy of René Descartes, who once said that the screams of animals being vivisected were simply the sounds of their body machines breaking down. Descartes argued that animals do not have souls because they lack the power of reason, and since they lack souls, they cannot suffer. Yet it is clearly stated in the Old Testament that animals are of the same breath of creation or origin as we, and all have or are living souls called nefesh in Hebrew. Thanks to the mechanistic and materialistic worldviews of Descartes, Newton and Francis Bacon, the stage was set by the 17th century for the unsoulment of animals and the desacralization of nature, which became an industrialized resource. Such views contaminated religious attitudes toward nature and animals, which now need to be changed in the light of new scientific evidence of the unity, ecological interdependence, and biological kinship of all life. Without any apparent ethical sensibility, scientists have recently created, through embryonic manipulation, creatures called geeps, monstrous chimeras with the head of a goat and the body of sheep. Through genetic engineering biotechnology, which may well alter the entire course of creation, animals like the dairy cow will in the future be made into biological machines to ever more efficiently serve the needs of man who plays God. Where indeed is the respect for the sanctity of life when animal beings are mutilated and deformed for human enjoyment, like the circus unicorn of Barnum and Bailey, which is nothing more than a goat with a transplanted horn in the center of its head. And what kind of love is it, except perhaps a perverse sentimentality for the deformed and helpless that makes people keep and breed genetically defective purebred dogs, like the bulldog, with such a deformed face that it has great difficulty breathing? Certainly, such creatures are to be loved, but it is surely unloving to deliberately propagate them so that there will be ever more generations of offspring who will suffer. If the human species has truly been made in the image of God, then should we not treat all living things as we would have God treat us? And that is with humility, respect, and compassion in our relations with each other, with nature, and with the animals. But instead, we choose to assume the authority of God in claiming dominion over God's creation. The image of St. George slaying the dragon, the serpent dragon as a sacred symbol of many pagan cultures, since it represents the forces of nature, gives religious sanction to man's domination of nature, 
which is regarded in an adversarial way as being evil, if not fallen. The ritual enactment of our domination over nature is exemplified by the rodeo, where animals are cruelly treated, roped and restrained, a public exhibition which, like the animal circus, indoctrinates children with the belief that it is not wrong to treat animals in such ways. It is a feeling of superiority and a lack of true humility and compassion that lead us to regard others as somehow inferior. As animal rights are violated today, so human rights have been long violated as by the white colonists who engaged in human slavery. That we have dominion over the rest of creation according to the book of Genesis does not mean that we have free license to exploit others for our own selfish ends. The original meaning of the word dominion, which is derived from the Latin domino to rule over, comes from the Hebrew word vayerdu. According to Rabbi Harold White, this word can be traced to the root verb yorad. Yorad means literally to go down, to place oneself in sympathy with the animal kingdom and to recognize our commonality with the animals. When dominion is motivated by love, we have the ecumenical politics of what amounts to a trans-species democracy. But when it is motivated simply by self-serving power, it amounts to nothing more than biological fascism. The human-centered, so-called anthropocentric view that Homo sapiens is a special and therefore superior creation, ironically linked with an anthropomorphic, human-like conception of divinity, has two pernicious consequences. The first is to set up a false duality between humans and other animals, between civilization and the environment, and between God and nature. The second is to create a linear, hierarchical worldview with God being conceived as being transcendent only and not also co-inherent or immanent in nature. This essentially patriarchal view, which Aristotle, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, and Calvin, among others, endorsed, stands in sharp contrast to a more holistic, egalitarian view where divinity, nature, humans, and animals are all one. This latter, so-called panentheistic view, places ethical constraints upon how we treat the rest of creation because God is not simply transcendent, God is also in all, and all is in God. St. Francis, in his teachings, emphasized that the animals and all of nature are part of God's creation, that they are in God and through or by way of them, God's creative love can be realized and revered. It is certain that when we had no civilization nor worldview that separated us from nature, because we were part of nature as gatherer hunters, we felt in the very core of our being our connectedness with the whole of creation. Nature, the earth, was seen as the all-providing mother and the female qualities of fecundity and nurturance as expressed in the Venus miniature carvings of Bronze Age cave dwellers were revered. The earth as mother goddess, as exemplified by the statue of Diana of Ephesus, was linked with a pre-Christian pagan reverence for nature and by such seasonal rituals as the harvest festival and the springtime dressing of the wells in England, which were later assimilated into Christianity. There was no question that animals and nature were sacred, had spirits or souls, and were part of the same origin or creation as we. The belief that animals had one or more guardian spirits was common to European cultures, like the symbol of Pan, protector of herds and flocks and wild creatures, which was part of the pantheon of Greco-Roman civilization before the rise of Christianity. We should also remember the animal-headed divinities of the last great civilization before ours, the Egyptian pantheon with its animal-headed divinities such as Isis, Anubis and Horus should not be misinterpreted as pagan animism that makes animals into gods. Rather, animals were perceived as manifestations of various aspects of divinity and were revered for these qualities such as Bastet the cat who exemplified qualities of grace, sagacity and fecundity. Likewise, to be concerned today about the non-human creation from a spiritual perspective and to 
reincorporate animals into the scope of moral and religious principles is not a regression to ancient polytheism and animism. In the Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita, we find the declaration, we bow to all beings with great reverence in the thought that God enters into them through fractioning himself as living creatures. This is not pagan animal worship. As Albert Schweitzer said, to the truly ethical man, all of life is sacred, including forms of life that from the human point of view may seem lower than ours. This is certainly not pagan idolatry. Yet, is it not a kind of idolatry to worship the image of oneself as God? The human-centered and male human image of divinity may well have its roots in the Greek pantheon where all divine and mortal beings, especially those that are female, are subordinate to the top god Zeus. It is likely from this cosmology today's patriarchal worldview of male superiority and domination finds its roots. The beautiful myth of Adam and Eve can be seen as a description of the evolution of human consciousness. Adam, after eating the apple from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, is no longer like any other animal. He is aware of his own nakedness, which means being aware of and terrified of his own mortality. He has a moral sensibility, knowing good from evil, and also possesses some godlike powers, such as creativity, instrumental knowledge, and the ability to objectify the world by giving names to things. It was Lauren Isley who wrote, the Eden of the present, that the animal world had known for ages, was shattered at last. Through the human mind, time and darkness, good and evil, would enter and possess the world. End of quote. Evil arises from human ignorance, arrogance, fear of life and death, and from the selfish use and abuse of our powers of dominion. In trying to become gods in and for ourselves, and thus separating ourselves from the created order and our place therein, we fail to recognize our own limitations and dependence upon the whole. Father Sean McDonough offers a cosmic view of sin, stating, if sin destroys the harmony between human beings and the natural world, then redemption to be complete must heal and renew the primordial unity and recreate the earth wherever it has been injured through human greed and vice. The teachings of all the world's major religions have long recognized the virtues of humility and compassionate benevolence toward all fellow beings as enlightened self-interest. Recent studies have shown that there is a direct link between cruelty toward animals in childhood and later violent and criminal behavior in adulthood. Compassion is a boundless ethic. It can never be arbitrary, yet only too often, for reasons of custom, convenience, expedience, and profit, we fail to give other animals equal and fair consideration. Do we not demean ourselves in our indifference toward the suffering that we cause them? and in our uncritical acceptance of animal exploitation. While creatures like the lamb were revered as sacred symbols by the Judeo-Christian tradition, we have the cruel incarceration of such creatures as the veal calf. Raised for 16 weeks in narrow crates, they are deprived of their most basic freedoms, even to be able to comfortably and easily stand up, turn around, lie down, walk, stretch, and interact with each other. It is also a tragic irony that the horrendous public spectacle of a bullfight is a most popular spectator event, particularly in Roman Catholic countries. There is a discrepancy today between what the various religions teach and preach and how their followers relate to the rest of God's creation, and between what is taught in terms of our place in nature, our duties towards the creation, and what science now reveals to us about animals and nature. In India, where Hinduism is the major religion and the cow is especially revered in temples and shrines, there is much abuse of these animals in slaughterhouses and as beasts of burden. There are also serious problems associated with ritual slaughter that leaders of the Islamic and Judaic traditions are at last beginning to address. As it says in the book of Isaiah, he who kills an ox is like he who kills a person. And the Koran proclaims, there is not an animal on earth 
nor a flying creature on two wings, but they are like unto you. And as the Bible proclaims that a merciful man will be merciful to his beast, so the holy prophet Muhammad said, whoever is kind to the creatures of God is kind to himself. In addition to regarding non-human animals as being morally worthy of consideration and making them part of our community of moral concern and social responsibility, they are also part of the same ecological community as we. We therefore harm them when we harm the environment. There is little reverence for the environment when nature is seen simply as a resource. We are turning the natural world into a polluted and industrialized wasteland. It is surely true that as the poet Marilyn Lesseur concluded, we can only destroy that which we objectify, end quote. And this happens when we treat nature and animals as resources and objects. Since the earth is our flesh, we harm ourselves and our children's children when we harm the earth. Industrial pollutants and agri-poisons, especially pesticides, contaminate our food and drinking water and along with acid rain are killing the life in freshwater lakes. Worldwide pollution is destroying the environment and the wildlife therein. Since everything is interconnected, our own health suffers as a consequence. Hence the epidemics of cancer, birth defects, genetic damage, and other complex health problems that we face today. And no amount of laboratory animal research and animal suffering and sacrifice is going to help prevent these problems. The covenant to dress and keep the Garden of Eden has been long broken. In spite of the implicit conservation message of the story of Noah, who saved the animals from the flood, the flood today is the holocaust of the animal kingdom, as witness the many abuses of animals today, such as the wholesale decimation of whales simply for their oil and other raw materials and the suffering and killing of wild animals in steel jaw leg hole traps for their fur, which no one in his or her right mind could wear. Wild animals are also poisoned and their habitats destroyed so that we may raise sheep and cattle and farm animal feeds to indulge our taste for meat. In addition to the cruel treatment of factory farmed animals, too often kept in overcrowded and stressful conditions, we should also consider the risks to our own health of the antibiotics and other drugs that are given to these animals to make them more productive and to help them cope with the stressful and disease-promoting conditions in which they are incarcerated. We should also reflect upon the fact that the more meat and other farm animal produce we consume, the more land is cleared and used to raise feed for farm animals. By so doing, we are contributing to the displacement and extermination of wildlife and of their habitats. There are alternatives to meat-based agriculture. For example, 360 pounds of soybean protein can be produced from one acre of land, while only 20 pounds of beef can be produced from one acre. One of the greatest threats to wildlife worldwide, other than human overpopulation, is the expanding cattle industry. The clearing of land, especially of tropical forests, to raise cattle for meat export to affluent countries and destruction of trees for firewood, combined with overpopulation, interact to contribute to drought, famine, and the collapse of traditional, sustainable agricultural practices. As the Bible instructs, as we sow, so shall we reap. In addition to modern chemically dependent agriculture, great harm is done to the environment by the timber industry. Vast hillsides of trees may seem natural, but these are simply industrial landscapes, since virtually nothing else can grow where these trees, all of one species, have been planted. In many parts of the world, the construction of dams for hydroelectric power in order to stimulate further industrial production and expansion has caused irreparable damage to nature. These trends can be reversed once it is realized that it is enlightened self-interest to do so. A sound and sustainable economy and a stable and healthy ecology go hand in hand. 
we can begin to repair the covenant by helping protect wildlife directly by not wearing their furs and indirectly by reducing or stopping our consumption of meat and other consumptive habits wasteful of natural resources. And chemically addicted farmers can shift to low input organic or regenerative agriculture which will benefit all of life. We can encourage children not to make pets of wild animals and come to respect the sanctity and dignity of all creatures, realizing that those that are domesticated pets, in quotes, are ours only in sacred trust and should not be humanized or anthropomorphized or be treated as objects of property or as toys or status symbols. Indeed, our companion animals are perhaps closer to divinity than we in the unconditional love that they bestow upon us. Companion animals, like all creatures, have needs and interests and are worthy of equal and fair consideration. Humane education and animal rights philosophy have done much to encourage these values and a more egalitarian attitude toward animals. As Albert Schweitzer said, without a reverence for all life, and by that we must also include nature, we will never enjoy world peace. The animal rights revolution, which holds that all creatures should be given equal and fair consideration, is part of a much deeper spiritual revolution which advocates respect for the sanctity of all life. As Sioux Medicine Man Black Elk said, we should understand well that all things are the works of the Great Spirit. We should know that he is within all things, the trees, the grasses, the rivers, the mountains, and all the four-legged animals and the winged peoples. And even more important, we should understand that he is also above all these things and peoples. When we do understand all this deeply in our hearts, then we will fear and love and know the Great Spirit. And then we will be and act and live as he intends." Close quote. We need to move away from exploitation and glorifying our own creation to exaltation and glorification and praise of God's creation as well. Reverend Thomas Berry has said, every being has its own interior, itself, its mystery, its numinous aspect. To deprive any being of this sacred quality is to disrupt the total order of the universe. Reverence will be total or it will not be at all. Close quote. Animals are indeed living souls or ensouled beings like us. Pythagoras insisted that animals share with us the privilege of having a soul, and Meister Eckhart contended the soul is not in the body, but the body is in the soul. The Hindu religion teaches that we and all creatures possess a spark of inherent divinity, the Atman. Those who revere nature and animals are often accused of deifying God's creation, which is wrongly called idolatry. Such heretics were once persecuted, even burned at the stake. But to have reverence only for God and not for God's creation and created order is to be blind to God, to the God inherent as love, wisdom, and mystery in a myriad wondrous manifestations that nature sustains. To have reverence only for an anthropomorphized God and not also for God's creation is surely the essence of idolatry. In Christianity, there are at least two saints, namely Saint Eustace and Saint Hubert, who early in their lives were noblemen who frequently went hunting. They both independently saw a vision of Christ on the cross between the antlers of a stag. This visionary experience, not unlike the Atman vision of inherent divinity in all living things of Hinduism, was their religious conversion away from wanton killing to helping alleviate the suffering of the world. As compassion is at the heart of Christianity, so it is the foundation of Buddhism. It was Gautama Buddha himself who said, friendship toward all creatures is the true religion. We share with other sentient life forms the will to live. Albert Schweitzer said that if we wish to understand the soul of an animal, we should attune our will to live with its will to live. St. Francis of Assisi, who called all animals our brothers and sisters, said, 
a man knows only as much as he has suffered. We share with other sentient beings the kinship of suffering, which moves us towards empathy, humility, and respect, as well as commitment to the alleviation of their suffering under our dominion through compassion and benevolent action. Compassion leads us to the realization of the sanctity of life and also of its sacred unity so that we may begin to live gently, conscientiously, in harmony and loving communion with all, living religiously. Religion is then not separate from everyday life. It is not simply a question of turning to religion to help the animal kingdom and to save the world. This would be no better than seeking some magical solution through philosophy, law, science, or technology. It is more a question of us becoming religious, living gently, and in reverence of all life. This is not purely a philosophy, cause, or crusade. It is essentially a way of life, a way of feeling, sensing, thinking, and acting, such that one does not in any way limit the freedom, sanctity, and fulfillment of others. This is the gentle way of living in communion. We will begin to live in communion when we begin to empathize and see the world through the eyes of other animals and when our self-centered worldview changes toward one of humility and kinship with all life. The view that animals are our brothers and sisters is equally the worldview of the American Indian as it was the teaching of St. Francis of Assisi, whose love and faith, according to legend, even enabled him to tame the feared wolf of Gubbio. Religious leaders worldwide are now beginning to speak for the animals and nature. The World Week of Prayer, including the blessing of animals, are part of this spiritual movement to bring peace and harmony to the world and to restore the sacred unity between humanity and the rest of creation. The basic teachings of all the world's major religions lead us toward a humane planetary stewardship. Since animals are part of the same ecological community of Earth as we, are they not also of the same origin or breath of creation as we? Should they not therefore be embraced within the same circle of compassion that constitutes our moral community of humane concern, since to exclude them is to deny our own biological and spiritual nature, as well as our kinship with them, and by so doing, deny God. Humane planetary stewardship is now a spiritual and a survival imperative for all religions to promote by applying their scriptural teachings to the present conditions of animal suffering, by taking action to correct a multitude of abuses, and by extending the golden rule to promote respect for our fellow creatures on planet Earth, as well as for Mother Earth herself. And when we begin to perceive divinity in and through all things, humankind will be inspired and guided along the gentle way of planetary stewardship, and in one voice say, grant that I may feel you always.